Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is your host, Guillermo Sabatier on Perspectives on Energy. Um, welcome to the show. Today we'll be discussing megawatt hours versus megawatts and how that can be sometimes misleading and confusing, but hopefully we'll clear it up. So again, uh, welcome once again. Uh, again, I am the Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute. And in here we have uh, entire programs to train the uh, electric grid operators and amongst other different parts of the, the electric utility industry. Uh, this week, I am working out of California for some of the utilities here. So uh, I am coming at you live from Vacaville, California. So, okay, so today um, th there have been a few videos out, uh, some of them on Think Tech as well, and, and I really enjoyed them. Uh, one of them, they were discussing the, uh, the general output or, or the demands of energy and how much surface area that would take for uh, electrifying the entire island with solar and then supplementing that with wind and then of course with energy storage and hydrogen and one of the things that is a great presentation and one of the things that i noticed however was that the way they were presenting the units of energy um it's a very important distinction we need to make regarding the difference between megawatts and megawatt hours or kilowatts and kilowatt hours or terawatts and terawatt hours, right? A sort of thing, or gigawatts and gigawatt hours. So th those are all different units, multiples of a thousand higher from each other. But the distinction there is the whole hour term, right? Which is really, it's the, the instantaneous number times whatever unit of time. Normally we decide to extend that over an hour and that's how we uh, get the entire area under a, under a curve. And that gives us the, um, energy hour, kilowatt hour, megawatt hour, gigawatt hour feature. Of course, you can imagine, right? If we say instantaneous 100 megawatts, that's instantaneous. There's no place to store that. There's no place to put that away. That's happening right now, and it could be gone the next instant. Whereas if you're consuming that over an hour, now you're getting billed, or you can take account for that whole thing over a span of one hour. So if you're looking at that for 24 hours, now you're looking at quite a lot of megawatt hours, right? Now it'll be, say it's 100 times 24, you're looking at, you know, 2,400 megawatt hours, not just 100, 100 megawatts every hour. So that's the important distinction. So when you hear megawatt hours, you're going to hear a number many orders of magnitude higher than the instantaneous measurement. So... Let's go and look at the first slide of a typical load curve of uh, generation versus load, right? And on there you see, for example, and this is of course uh, old school, back in the olden days before we had all of that solar and wind in our system. That's a typical load curve, you know, for a typical summer day uh, in the system. And as you can imagine, right, uh, that goes over a span of 24 hours, right? So as, you, as you're imagining there, I've got two curves, right? So one superimposed top of the other, or the one in blue is a load, which is how much people are consuming or demanding. The other red one is basically what your generators are making. And then in there, you're accounting for a 500 megawatt purchase, right? Over, over every hour for 24 hours, the entire day, right? Okay. Not that important, but we would have, but that, that it matters, right? As you figure out what is the instantaneous requirement, right? To be able to meet that load. So uh, at any given point, at any given hour, at any given minute, at any given second, right? You have to be able to supply the number on any point on that blue line. And that is your how you demand for the, your, your instantaneous demand, right? That's megawatts. So it can be, as you can imagine, at uh, four or five in the morning, that it, that will be the lowest point. While well, you're looking at maybe six thousand or five thousand five hundred megawatts of of instantaneous to, uh, generation at that point, that is what you're supplying. Thank you so much. So right there is just but be, just beneath six thousand megawatts, right? At four in the morning, it's the lowest point of the lowest point of a twenty four hour period. Now, granted, right, uh, that is the lowest point. And then, of course, after that, it begins to slowly increase, right? And it continu continually changes every hour through the next 24 hours. And then the cycle repeats itself every day. Now, if this was a flat line and you take an average of that line over that 24 hours, it becomes very easy to calculate. And that would be wonderful if, if the demand was not variable. 
but of course we all know uh, we all sleep we all wake up we all turn things off and on we all have the work cycles we all have different points where we're traveling to, to different parts so you know we start our work day at 6 7 a.m everybody begins to wake up and they begrudgingly go go get up and go take a shower turn things on uh, start uh, going getting their day started and then they maybe cook some breakfast turning lights on and then eventually they all find out where to work at that point you know things begin to heat up and as things begin to heat up during the day then the air conditioning runs turning lights on in the offices or wherever they're at or even if they're at home working from home they're using energy so at every at every time they turn on a light switch they turn on something they turn on a motor turn on a pump or any industrial process they are then of course the the demand for electricity is increasing right and that's the instantaneous demand so, but if you notice, you're looking already, I guess, at time index 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., if you zoom into that, where are we at that point? I think we're looking at maybe 10,000 megawatts instantaneous, right? So at 10, 10 a.m., we're already up to the graph of uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, almost 10,000 megawatts at that point, right? So uh, one thing I want to point out, right, that everything in the area under those curves, right? It is the integrated value. You're looking at an area under, under a curve, which is of course, any point in that curve times, you know, whatever time has already elapsed. So, and that is usually what gets billed or measured or metered. And then that, that that's part of the utility revenue or what they count as, you know, at megawatt hours produced or kilowatt hours produced, right? And that is what I often hear, right? As like, hey, we are, it's, 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 it's sort of like the nameplate rating of a unit. So if a power plant can produce, for example, 100 megawatts, nameplate rating instantaneous, that is its capacity. It cannot make more than that. It can probably make less, but it cannot make more than that. And then of course, if we then say or boast, hey, this thing ran for 24 hours, and then we say, ah, we've made 2,400 you know, megawatt hours. So that is what becomes misleading. It sounds like it's a lot more than it is. In reality, it can only produce 100 megawatts at any given point in time, at any given minute, at any given second. That is a maximum it can put out. So when they say when they say uh, capacity, right, it is important to understand that, that we call it a mega, instantaneous megawatts of capacity. Uh, when they say installed capacity, right, uh, it doesn't mean it's always going to run, which is what bothers me. Because if you have a lot of solar resources on an island and it isn't available 24 hours a day, you cannot say that you, know, you have the capacity of X number of megawatt hours because it's not. You can say it has capacity of X number of megawatts from any time between, between sunrise and sunset, perhaps, right? And that's probably a more... Uh, is it's not such a disingenuous way of, of, of promoting what it is you're trying to accomplish. Now, how is this any different and why does it matter? Right. Okay. So let's go to the next slide where we illustrate the two different analogies, right? And here you're looking at a one hour road trip. Okay. So say you have a lot of different, say you have two vehicles, right? And I'm going to call this the odometer as a consumption. That's your megawatt hours or kilowatt hours, right? Demand, I guess, is your speed. It's the rate at which you can put power out at any, 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 any given point. And, of course, you got a little station wagon, and you have the uh, on one side, you have the race car on the other. So for that little, like, slower vehicle running at 10 miles per hour, a 10-hour road trip, it's going to cover 100 miles. Same odometer, same distance. It just took a lot longer, right? Now, if you look at the race car traveling at 100 miles per hour, that same 100 miles can be covered in one hour. And that is a difference I'm trying to point out, right? Where it's like kilowatts versus kilowatt hours, not uh, that 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 uh, that description of it as a capacity or the ability to actually like explain what the capability of it is at, at any instantaneous point. It's not exactly accurate. And it's important that we when we when we discuss or promote, for example, the use of renewable resources or, re or actually any resource or any consumption, or we explain, for example, how much was produced. Now, if we talk about production, that makes absolutely perfect sense. You produce as much or as much of this much time, but it is misleading because when uh, you want to understand, you want to understand how much can you support at any given time, the instantaneous demand or the megawatts becomes important. So. If you have, for example, the peak load of any given day, right? Well, if you have a peak load of 20,000 megawatts for your for that season, well, and you only have 18,000 megawatts available, 
And guess what? You will be deficient 2,000 megawatts and you will have to shed 2,000 megawatts of load because you just don't have enough. And that is the important thing. You may say you have 20, 40,000 megawatt hours available, you know, but but it's not, not the case. At that point in time, for that minute or that half hour, you cannot do it because you just don't have enough online or capacity to be able to satisfy that need. So once again, this, I want to stress the fact that it is important that we clarify the difference between capacity versus uh, con consumption or how much energy was delivered or how much energy you can deliver. The other thing is as well is that there's always the assumption made that this entire load is flat or has no variability or has, for example, no change. And that is a problem because nothing nothing in this industry really stays flat unless it's base load. And even that lady has been moving. So another thing I wanna point out, right, is when we have the situation where we are looking at um, generation that normally is never dispatched very much like nuclear plants, right? And, and, and larger, larger utilities in, in the mainland, there was a time where they would sit at their at base load, which means usually their, their optimal 95% to 100% output, they would stay there for 18 months and they would come down only if they had an emergency or if they had a uh, a need to come down to refuel and do like the 18 month maintenance outage. So, but now I'm seeing certain utilities actually have a day ahead next day dispatch where they will dispatch depending on what the load is and to be able to accommodate what the renewable outputs are for that given day. So what does that mean? In this case, you're now displacing some generation that is really rather cost-effective and, and reliable and replacing it with variable solar energy, which is wonderful. It's 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 great once the capital expenditure is put in. However, you are now displacing reliable generation just to accommodate for it. And that and then once you shut units off or you dispatch, for example, large base load units, it is very difficult and expensive to actually have them regulate and move and, and do load following in this case. So what's the solution for this, right? Uh, so one of the things that I'm noticing uh, is that there have been, as we install more and more solar capacity in utility scale solar capacity on the grid, we're seeing more and more uh, utility scale solar curtailments where they are basically, it's it's an inverter based resource. So the, the they, they call the, the, the owner or the producer, the utilities call them and they tell them, listen, we're, we cannot absorb any more power. And they get to the point where they almost shut off all of the generation to accommodate all the solar. And in most parts, right, you are now at a point where, yes, we're running completely on solar for about four or five hours. But the problem is you put yourself in a rather really dangerously unreliable risky posture because now you have to then cut back on the amount of solar. So in other words, you're basically throwing away or you're, you, you, you have an asset that's being underutilized and you have a great deal of capital expenditure already behind you where you spent all this money on these facilities and now you are not maximizing that asset because there's nowhere to put that power. There's no transmission lines to move it anywhere and you don't have enough load to, to supply that. And then to type it all off, there's distributed energy resources, which are solar panels and batteries at the customer's house at the residential level, which is also cutting down on demand. So where is all this headed, right? I think the next best thing to do and as utilities and consumers can actually probably work in better partnership overall is to perhaps give, well, as every single new solar project that I've seen coming online now, there's usually a token battery on there and not, not enough to really make a significant impact, but there is a token battery requirement they're fulfilling. Uh, my expectation is and my hope is that as more and more of them come online, they have more batteries already in place. And that's hopefully used to be able to um, absorb that variability, right, or that excess. Eventually, those batteries are going to get full and they have to push out and into the grid again. So we'll see what happens there. The other challenge there is the, uh, is the uh, distributed energy resources. A lot of utilities and a lot of like, uh, public service commissions are changing the tariffs in which uh, some of them are getting away or getting are doing away with that metering because there's nowhere to put that solar energy. So now, now you don't have enough load to be able to like absorb those uh, utility scale solar sites. And a lot of the residential uh, distributed energy resources are pretty much supplying their own load by using their own solar panels, which is great, right? But the problem is now you don't have load, you don't have any need, so you have to shut down all this generation. 
And if you have anything happen, uh, you have to, or a lot of variability, and you have to turn generation back on. It doesn't happen in a drop of a hat. It's not like a light switch. It takes 15, 20 minutes to bring on a generator. So this becomes a problem. Right. So ideally, batteries would, would be an ideal source. However, you know, there we're still quite a ways away from making a lot of them commercially viable. And many of them don't run for more than a few hours anyway. And so that's another challenge for the system. So what's happening here is that we're noticing a shift away from this or a slowing down and perhaps uh, more accountability as to what the true cost of these resources are. And then a few weeks ago, I did another episode on what's happening with the regulatory environments. So as you probably remember, NERC on its own has a, NERC, of course, and the industry have changed some of the regulations and they lowered the threshold as to what is now subject to regulation. And it's, it's going to be in effect quite soon. So as independent power producers, or rather sites that own uh, uh, solar generation facilities, right? They will now be subject to the NERC regulation. Uh, and that on its own, for some of them, has been quite discouraging, but it's only because they don't possibly understand what the, what the scope of NERC regulation is. It shouldn't be anything really intimidating, and it's really not hard, not hard to comply with that. It's just a matter of making sure that they don't create a reliability risk in the system. So, um, so, so we have different challenges, but when, I think with the right kind of like... Uh, step design that we can implement whenever we're putting in these resources, we probably are going to have to figure out a way to uh, either store a lot of this excess energy or have some of the, the utilities in partnership with the customers and some of these like independent power producers go ahead and figure out a way to better manage these resources. Otherwise, you're going to have all of these like uh, independent power producers, which are usually private, privately owned generators. Uh, not owned by the utilities, right? And then they're going to, going to go ahead and place these things in service and they will not be getting paid for megawatts, right? Because they won't be producing megawatts because they will be asked on a, as, a, as a reliability requirement to curtail their output. And as more and more of them come on, you're going to get to the point where there's way more generation than there is load altogether. So not only are you, are you replacing uh, the utility with these resources for certain parts of the day, now it gets to the point where there's nowhere to put these megawatts at. So that it's in itself is becoming a problem. So what do you think will happen next, right? So ultimately, so if you invest all this money in an asset that you're not allowed to run because nobody can buy your resource because there's nowhere to, nowhere to place it, then eventually you will get out of that business. And my fear is that it becomes less and less attractive for investors to go ahead and uh, install these like, solar facilities at the utility scale. And it's already becoming a problem for some of these like some of these distributed energy resources for uh, rooftop solar companies to actually make, make it profitable. In California, for example, uh, there's I think there's legislation in place or it's become, going to be in place pretty soon where multifamily housing units, or if you're a landlord, or uh, what's happening is, uh, case in point, if you're a renter of a single family home, and that single family home has solar panels, you as the renter cannot benefit from that solar solar power production of your of that roof. It's owned by the landlord, and the landlord uh, sells that to the utility, and then you get to buy a retail price, retail price energy for your consumption. So that sort of it, that sort of challenge is interesting because now now that puts a dent, and it makes daily solar panels less attractive, specifically for the renters. The other problem you're going to encounter, of course, is is a it's a disparity in equity, right? So now it's you know only homeowners can get to enjoy the benefits of having solar panels. Landlords get to enjoy, you know, the benefit of solar or distributed energy resources or solar panels on the rooftops, and you can probably imagine what's where and where that's going to lead at some point, right? So a lot of challenges here where I think we can we can probably overcome them with a little bit better planning, better coordination, but again, a lot of that is really in effect. We need to understand what demand is. We need to understand what load is. We need to understand what capacity is. And of course, we need to understand that uh, you cannot generate power right now more than what you need unless you're storing it somewhere. Right? That's the other thing that's interesting. So you can only go to zero, zero, you can only run 
generation that you need for your load. Otherwise, it has to go somewhere else. And uh, when you overgenerate generation, you have problems with frequency, voltage. When you undergenerate, which uh, a, lot of, a lot of that variable resource introduces problems like that into the system, you will, of course, have under frequency, under voltage when you undergenerate. Um, so hopefully this will clear up some items. Um, I think that um, I, I really applaud some of the efforts made, especially with Hawaii and how they're installing a lot of this rooftop solar and utility scale solar. But we also need to be very careful. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that there are geothermal facilities in Hawaii already that are only running at maybe 30, 40 percent capacity. So part of that problem is because there's nowhere for that power to go. There's no uh, submarine cables connecting all these different islands to all these different loads that they could serve. So uh, ideally, just these two plants alone would probably serve most of the islands together. But again, there, there's, there's nowhere to put them. And I think those facility, facilities were built with under the notion that there was going to be a uh, submarine cable installed at some point or several cables installed at some point interconnecting all the islands, but that didn't happen. Forget the fact that there's already lots of undersea cables already in place for communications and other purposes, but somehow there's always a challenge to get that uh, approved and built and then have somebody commit to that kind of like an investment again. So but hopefully that one day it happens. And um, I think that that's a great resource to have geothermal. It's also a great idea to have diversity in your portfolio. And I'm all for hydrogen, hydrogen production, hydrogen power, uh, just to make it just we want, I want to make sure that it's commercially viable. I know that uh, Next Era Energy and FPNL is already in December. They are going to actually go commercial on their first site, which I'm pretty excited to see. And and, and I'm I'm hopeful that you know, with that that is a good benchmark, and you'll see that throughout the industry. So I'm looking forward to that, and hopefully we can all learn from that. All right. Well, so thank you all again for tuning in. I know this was a shorter episode than usual, and I have a lot of information on this rather like narrow topic. But if you have any questions, please feel free to write down in the comments. And uh, once again, uh, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and uh, have a wonderful day.